Hi, it's Jo here for Minerva. Um, I'm here today to have a look through some patterns, especially if you're the sort of person who hasn't used a pattern very much and you've ordered something magic like this and it's come in the post and you're excited about it but you don't really know how to use it very well so we're going to go through some of the um, instructions some of the markings some of the things that will help you understand how to use a pattern and we'll also have a look at some indie patterns and um, they're for sale on Minerva and uh, we can have a look at how to use those and how they're different and how you might make a choice between choosing one pattern against another the really good thing about being able to read one of these patterns is if you can read one of these, you can read many, many, many patterns because they have the same sort of pattern of language and they have the same terminology and you'll build up a bank of uh, words that you understand and when you read them, you know what to do. And also with online um, forums and things these days, you can look up a pattern review really easily. You'll find because they're worldwide, there's a lot of people who've made them. So you can go and find out if anybody's made a particular change or if somebody doesn't quite understand an instruction, then you can go and look at it and it's probably the same one that you didn't understand. You can check that out online because it's quite prevalent that people will have made this pattern. So there are sort of two camps of patterns. Um, there are indie pattern designers and they're all quite different. That's their unique style. We'll have a look at those in a minute. And then there are what's sort of traditionally called the, the big four, the top four, but there's some business amalgamations there, which mean they're not quite all the top four. So there's New Look and Verde and McCall's and Simplicity. But really what I'm talking about are the patterns that come in a packet and inside is the tissue paper pattern pieces and all the instructions. Um, one of the advantages of these patterns is this one shows it very well is that you can buy one pattern and you can get lots of different things on it so this pattern has trousers a t-shirt a sweatshirt a shirt so you can buy these and you can start simple and then you can move on once you've got the hang of it or once you've decided that's quite a good size for you or once you've decided i really like the instructions on those so this one's got a range of a whole wardrobe on this one's got a jumpsuit and trousers and a top so you for quite good value for money if you like all of the things on there or you might try a majority of the things and think you've had really good value out of them. The thing I don't like about these patterns is sometimes the fabric choice and sometimes the pictures don't really sort of endear you to want to buy it. So I really, really um, encourage you to look on the back at the schematic, the schematic drawing there. And it really gives you the shapes and the silhouettes that you're going to be aiming for with this pattern. This is um, New Look 6301, which is what I'm wearing now. It actually looks quite complicated, but it wasn't. It was a, a really great wrap dress to sew up. There's lots of people who've made this on the Minerva site. If you go and have a look, you'll see some really, really nice ones. If you decide to choose an indie pattern, which is an independent designer, a um, really talented designer who's decided to release their own patterns, um, I've got you here I've got one from Closet Case, I've got one from Grainline Studio, I've got Tilly and the Buttons ones, I have a lot of those, and a sew so over it one. Um, you won't get the same continuity of instruction writing that you will get with the other ones. So if you choose one of these as your first project, you'll either really love it and you'll want more of the same, or you'll have to keep relearning over and over again. So I learned to sew with these um pet tissue patterns because then I knew understood all the terminology and now when I'm using these I feel really comfortable with them however if you buy Tilly and the Buttons ones her original remit when she set up her business was to have uh, sewing for beginners so you might find that if, you, if this is your first pattern you ever buy you might think oh that's great because it gave me all the instructions there are advantages to these over the other ones in that it's often on paper not on tissue so it lasts a little bit longer and the instructions can be really, really varied. So, for example, um, in a Tilly pattern, you get a full pictorial photo journey all the way through, which is good because you have the, the basic instructions and you have a little picture to show you. And also you could use the blog to help you sew along. Some of them don't have the, a little booklet or their booklet doesn't quite go down the photo route. 
but you will have a lot of information. This one has a lot of diagrams and it really does show you where all the seam lines are and, and how to do really intricate parts of the sewing. So that one's from Closet Case. In a sew over it pattern, you don't have a paper pocket that rips, you get a little card envelope. And in here you get different instructions. So you've got pictures, not quite as photogenic as the other one and not quite as detailed as Closet Case, but you'll get to find out which you like and then you maybe you, that style will be a sort of style that you like. Indie patterns tend to have quite a consistent style because it's quite a personal choice of the designer. So, so over it ones are quite a vintage style. Um, closet case ones are quite a utility style, a very um, long lasting. You buy one of these patterns and that shirt dress will last a long, long time. It won't go out of fashion really quickly, but it's a really um, clever silhouette and it has really good design lines. This is one of my all-time favourite patterns. This is from Greyline Studio. And their instructions, it's a whole booklet of instructions. Whereas some, when you learn with the other ones, you just get one paper sheet, which is sometimes a little bit daunting because you think, well, I, there aren't enough instructions here. But it's a good way to learn. This is a good way to learn. You just have to decide what you think you would feel most comfortable with when you're going to be a beginner. So I'm going to use this one as an example to show you through how to cut out all your pattern pieces and get everything out of the packet and um, get yourself started. I know this isn't one of the big pattern ones that I talked about, but this is the one that's got the smallest pattern pieces in. Otherwise, I'm flapping a load of tissue at you, which makes a bit of a noise. So when you get your pattern, it's all exciting. The first thing you need to do is to decide on your size and that's on the back. And because this is an American pattern, then... Um, the sizing, I'm not going to necessarily leap to my ready to wear, go to next, pick up a t-shirt top for size 12 because I want to really measure myself against the pattern pieces. So you're going to measure your bust, your waist and your hip and this one's in inches and then you're going to put a little circle or write them down on a piece of paper the ones you are now there's a really big chance that um you will fall between a few of them so your bust measurement might be larger than your waist or your waist might be similar to your bust or you might have large larger hips compared to your bust so you need to measure those then you need to find the best fit one that doesn't mean you're going to compromise on what you're going to make it means you need to make sure you cut out the biggest size that you need and then make alterations going downhill because, you know, we can't cut something out that's too small, but we can cut something out that's a little bit big and make an alteration to it. So measure yourself, decide which piece you're going to, uh, which size you're going to have, and then we can cut out the pieces. So you haven't finished using the packet yet. You you use the packet to find the picture that you like and the design that you like. You've used the size chart to work out which size of the paper to cut out. And then you need to be thinking about what fabric do I need to be using because you can get a real fail if you're trying to make a pattern using the wrong fabric, particularly if it's a stretch woven um, problem because you can't make a stretch item of clothing out of a woven pattern unless you've got a lot of skill in adapting and changing some of the proportions. So this one is a scout tee and there's a little thing at the bottom that says the scout tee is a woven t-shirt with cap sleeve. So this isn't a t-shirt that's stretchy, this is like a sort of summer top. And then it tells you here some of the fabrics that you can use and cotton is on the list and that's what I've got so that's great. So I'm going to show you how to cut that out and how to read the markings on the paper. It's a really good idea to have in mind that the first time you make a pattern um, that you cut it out and then you make up a little version of it in a cheaper fabric or an old bed sheet or a duvet or um, some material that you don't need just so that you can check things like does it go around my armhole 
does it um, pull across my bust is it too short across the shoulders does it hang off my shoulder seam so making a twirl um, is you know I don't do it every time but I think if you're new to sewing and you've spent a lot of money on a pattern and you're and you really want it to go well from the start it's a really good idea not to cut into some beautiful fabric um, until you've had a go at making a twirl and just really got to grips with how to sew your pattern, what, how to um, follow the markings and things. It's really important if you're a beginner not to peak too soon. I've cut out um, a size 8 in this pattern. So on the big sheets of paper that I cut this out of, I followed the line all the way for the size 8. And then there's some markings on here that are really, really important. And I can only really show you with a piece of fabric. So I'm going to get some fabric and then I can show you where, how all the markings relate to where you put them on the piece of fabric. So there's a front and a back t-shirt. Um, this is the armhole, this is the shoulder, this is the neckline and this double arrow here that points to the edge says place on fold so you must put this on the fold of the fabric which I hope you can see at the top of the uh, screen and the back is the same so even though I'm turning the paper over I still need to have that on the fold and then I'm going to pin those in place. I'm just going to stop that one falling off the table. And then I'm going to tell you what some of the other markings are. So place on fold means that your fabric is folded so that when you open that out, it looks like a vest top shape. On a sleeve piece, you'll get a little notch that shows you the top of the arm so that will match the shoulder seam you've got your one notch which is for your front armhole and you've got two notches that show it's the back because although these look similar they're not the same so one will have a slightly bigger arc in than the other so that one one dot matches one dot and then the two dots match the back one You'll see on here there's a grain line and this is quite important if you're new to sewing because you might not know what that is. It means that if you were cutting out your material, you need to make sure that this grain line runs along the straight grain of the fabric. So I've got no stretch there at all because it's a woven fabric. All the little strawberries underneath are going to be in the same direction as the rest of my top because I'm keeping the sleeve on the same line as my top it's tempting if you're new to save a bit of fabric and try and squeeze it in somewhere like that the trouble with that is this fabric stretches on the when it's not on the grain and that's called cutting on the bias so then your sleeve will stretch out of shape your hem line will have like all ripples in it so you have to keep the grain line matching the straight grain of the fabric as soon as you feel it stretching you're not on the grain line and obviously if you've got a directional print like little houses or something you don't want your top to have the houses the right way up on the front and the, and the houses upside down on your sleeve so that's another little thing to look out for so if you're using a pattern one of the trickiest pieces to cut out is a piece that's not cut on the grain and um, this is my neckband piece it is a replacement piece actually I've used this pattern so much that my neckband piece sort of fell to pieces and it is no word of lie that the dog ate a bit of the end of it so I've had to recut another one and I keep it in the packet but so this has a very different grain line on it so this says it would like the straight grain to be like that but then you've got this piece of material that's you know not fitting the shape so you it's really tricky to try and find a place where you can put this and it feels quite wasteful but I'll show you why it's so important and it's really important that you get that on that straight grain I'm going to try and show you it's the straight grain so that fabric is not moving whereas that way 
it's really stretchy but I want it to be stretchy because I want it to go around the neck and I'm just doing these pieces um, a little bit at a time but it's really good again if you're new there'll always be a cutting diagram inside a pattern I'll show you that so it's showing you to place this on the fold on the fold to make sure that your arm piece has got the grain line going in the same place and you'll see that piece that I'm talking about now that's that neckline piece and that's going looks like it's going across the grain but it's not the center of it is on the grain and then the ends stretch out onto the what's called cutting on the bias here's an example of why you cut on the bias like that because it is so tempting to think that you're wasting a piece of material and not um, just cutting out a little straight piece off the edge. This piece around here has been cut on the bias so it lies really flat on a curve because that fabric's got that stretch in another direction all the way around there is done on a curve and all of this. This is just a trial I made up but you can see if you don't cut on the bias it's all wobbly it can't go around a curve because the grain of the fabric can only go in that straight line. So you, it's got quite a wobbly armhole on this bit at the bottom where it's very curved. It's got particularly got a lot of ripples in it. It's worse on the other side. And it kept like pulling away from the sewing machine because it, it wasn't lying flat enough to go around a curve. So this is what you don't want. And this is what you do want when you're cutting out a neckband that's got that grain line that means you need to cut it on the bias. So that's pinned on the fold. This is the front piece. And here on the armhole is a little line and that's called a notch. And when you cut this out, you're going to just mark the fabric in some way there's lots of ways you can do it you can do a tiny little snip that's not bigger than the seam allowance just a little snip so that when you hold two pieces together you'll see the two little snips you can mark it with a chalk you can cut a little triangle out you can do that in lots of different ways but you need to mark that because what that's going to show you is when you put the arm hole piece in it will show you where those two notches need to meet up and that's what makes sure that this arm piece this sleeve will fit in that gap and it gives you a much smoother line it'll show you where to ease fabric in or take fabric a little bit tighter it'll give you all those things it'll give you really comfortable armholes there's no other patterns on markings on here there's a length and shorten line so um, I often use this line because I'm very short in the body so but this pattern's okay for me but you can cut that and overlap it if you want to make it the top shorter or you can cut that and open it out and that will make the top longer you you know you can add a bit on the bottom but really what you want is to can keep the consistent shape of the design if you just add a bit on the bottom you won't have the same um, shape around the bottom hemline because that is in a place that means you keep the shape of the pattern. So I'll maybe show that in another tutorial. So at the moment, we're going to cut that out and we're going to have a look at um, another marking. So we've looked at notches, we've looked at place and fold, we've looked at cutting all our way around the size that we need. final thing to do before you take your paper off your material is to mark the notches and you might have marked them with a little snip like I have or you could just mark them with pencil that's why um, you might have seen on one of my cutouts I had the fabric so that the wrong side was facing which is really good if you've got a lot of markings so this pattern hasn't got darts but if we had darts then I would definitely fold my fabric with the wrong side facing so that I could mark all the uh, dark points and then when I come to uh, put sew it together the markings won't be on the outside so I'm just going to spend uh, two minutes just making sure that all the little markings that we've talked about are marked onto the fabric because once you've taken the paper off 
you don't want to have to keep flapping the bits of paper back out of the packet to look for little indicators and markings to sew. Last few things before you really get cracking on with sewing, you need to know what the seam allowances are. So on this pattern it's half an inch, um, you need to check your pattern, it will definitely say on there what the seam allowance is and you need to do that, you can't just put it under the machine and sew a straight line because all your other pieces won't fit inside it. The sizing relies on you using the seam allowance that they've given. So check out what that is, whether it's on an envelope pattern or an indie pattern, but it will always say. So my first instruction says um, put the material right sides together. That's the si right side is the side that you wear on the outside, the nice side. And you're going to put right sides together and pin them. And you might see it abbreviated as RST, that means right sides together. If you're new to sewing, which is probably why you're watching this video, um, there are a few things you can do to make sure you get your seam allowance right. And that is you can mark it with some chalk so that when you're sewing and taking the pins out, you're following your chalk line if you're confident enough to take pins out and sew at the same time. And if you're new and you just want to concentrate on learning how to use your sewing machine, then you might want to tack or baste, that's the word you will see on a pattern, by putting big running stitches in to hold it together. And then you can really concentrate on using your sewing machine rather than trying to pull out pins at the same time. So another word that will come up on your instructions quite a lot is finish the seams and you can do that in lots of different ways. It depends what you've got and is your preferred method. You can cut it with pinking shears, which zigzags the edge. You can use a zigzag stitch just to, on, your normal, on your normal machine. You might have an overlocker stitch or an overcasting foot. So they're a little bit more advanced but if you're just starting out you can cut with pinking shears or you can zigzag the edges i've got an overlocker so i'm just going to whiz around my seams with an overlocker so they're not fraying while i'm working with you another word you might see on a sewing pattern is a stay stitch and that is where you don't sew anything to anything else it's quite confusing because if you're new you think i don't know what i'm stitching but you're just putting a row of stitching around the neckline. Um, it tends to be where you do it, especially if you're going to add a collar. And you're just going to sew a row of stitching, not to anything else, inside the seam allowance. And it stops that grain stretching out like I showed you earlier on. It means that the fabric will stay in those straight grain lines. The weave won't open up. So stay stitching you might see in a pattern very early on in the instructions. So although I'm making a pattern with an indie pattern, you can see in, in comparison from a big four pattern, you get the same sort of information. So you get um, which pieces you need, which um, numbered pieces you need for each design, to so depending on which dress you choose or top you choose, which pieces you'll need. You'll get the cutting layouts, which while you're new, you'll probably follow quite um closely but once you get better at understanding fabrics you might be able to move your fabrics around a little bit there's also some notes here little pictures showing notches and little techniques and then it will ask you to find your size which we talked about look at the pattern markings which we talked about fold lengthening and shortening notches cutting lines And then it will ask you here some of the sewing directions and give you some of the terminology that you might encounter in the pattern. And then it will ask you to start following the instructions. And really, if you learn to sew with a big four pattern, that will also take you back in time to use a vintage pattern because they're very, very similar. So I sew a lot with vintage patterns, but I find them quite easy to follow. But then I learnt with a big four pattern. So... It's that continuity of language that I talked about at the beginning that is um, useful when you've learned how to sew with these big four patterns. So you get sizing, preparing your fabric. I showed you this little grain line 
thing here. There's all of the um, techniques and what to do with your fabric, all the cutting diagrams, and then it will take you onto number one where you follow the pattern really, really carefully, stage by stage. Another word you might come across is understitch. So understitch is another one of those stitches that's behind the scenes, a bit like stay stitching, but it does a really good job. So the pattern asks you to press the binding or if your top has a facing away from the garment. So we've pressed the binding away from the garment like this. And you're going to stitch really, really close to your seam line that you made to attach the binding and you're going to flip it up so it will be behind that's going to be the front of my top and just behind there will be under stitching and that stops facings flapping out it makes bindings lie really nice and flat on curves some people skip it but never never skip under stitching it really makes your clothes lie really flat and makes them look really um, professional Okay, so under the machine, you're going to stitch on the facing. This is the this is the facing, this is your top, this is the facing. And underneath, you're going to make sure that all that seam allowance is brushed up. Um, just putting the neckband on, so it says attach neckband right sides together, so it's right sides together, and then it's using the word grade, so it's saying grade out the seam allowance. So now what it wants me to do is to cut off some of the seam allowance bulk, so it doesn't want all this thick two layers of cord round our necks, it wants us to take this off cutting it off by half right, so we're going to keep trimming that like this so you're taking out half so that's called grading the seam allowance so you would keep cutting I'm doing it at a funny angle I need to have it so that I can cut it right-handed but I'm going to cut that piece off not the back just this another thing you might be asked to do on patterns is to clip the curves so without clipping the stitching, I'm going to clip these so that when it's folded the other way, those seams inside can spread out a little bit or overlap, depending on if it's a concave or a convex curve. Next part of the instructions, um, which is in any pattern that you might want to follow, is to put some easing stitches in the sleeve head. So between the notches, which is why we made the notches when we cut the pattern out, we're going to put two rows of running stitches. We can do that by hand or we can use a long machine stitch. And we're going to put those into the top of that sleeve head so that when we're trying to fit that shape into the armhole, it enables the material to curve over at the top it doesn't mean you're going to get a 1980s puff sleeve by having a gather in it's just going to help the fabric curve over the shoulder just going to show you one last thing before i sign off for weeding patterns which is putting the arm all in so you'll see some of the things that we've done earlier are starting to pay off now so you you pin the sleeve in the underarm you find those two notches and match them together there and there and then you find the sleeve head notch and you match that up so you've got one two three four points and then you get get the rest of this material and ease it into the gap and that's why you've got these easing threads and you'll pull them and they'll just slowly pull some of the fabric to get it the same length and then you can work really hard 
to get the puckers out when you sew it but if you sew on the seam allowance again if you sew too close to the edge it'll be all ripply if you sew on this nice flat bit here you'll get a really smooth um, sleeve and then there's hemming and you can read instructions for that and um, there might be darts to work towards on another pattern but really enjoy choosing a pattern and working through it stage by stage essentially everything you need to know will be there you've just got to read it methodically and work through it um, I'm going to finish now I'm going to finish this top and uh, put it on to show you what it looks like and then I think you could probably buy this pattern you could make yourself a cord one for winter you could make a cotton poplin one for spring you could make a cotton lawn one for summer once you get really good you could make one out of silk or crepe to wear in the evenings it's a really great pattern but really any pattern is good if you follow it step by step by step thanks for watching so here it is finished if you're feeling it's pulling around here then you might have forgotten to clip the curve if you're getting it pulling here you might need to grade up a size on your hip if it's too big here you might need to grade in to a lower size but i make a lot of these tops i make don't forget to make things out of plain fabric so you've got items to wear with pattern skirts and pattern trousers so that's another one uh, once you get a little bit braver you can start to use up some of your bits of material to um the back is cord, navy needle cord, and this is a piece of visc viscous on the front which has got a bit more drape. This neckline's different, I added the bias binding as the pattern, but then I folded the binding to the front, not to the back, so you get more of a t-shirt edge binding on that one. So I hope you get to choose a pattern, whether it's one of the big four patterns or whether you want to choose an indie pattern and find your style, but hopefully you can choose whatever pattern you want from Minerva and get a really successful sale.